Now, it's no secret that Bright Nights is going to be a very divisive set. You're either going to love it or hate it because it is mech-centric, mech-themed, and basically mech-only, right? With a few cherries on top or sprinkles here and there for some players. But for most, it is just a one dynamic set where any card that they might want if they're not overly interested in mech, well, they're just going to pick it up from the secondary market. And what do I mean by other cards? Well, one important feature of Bright Lights is the new expansion slot. And I personally have voiced my criticisms and some of the concerns I have surrounding the expansion slot. But one way or another, you do have to admit that what the expansion slot attempts to achieve, it does so wonderfully. And it is just something you really need to take a step back and admire the beauty of the expansion slot. Hey everyone, I'm Clue. And yeah, let's continue talking about the expansion slot. So, starting off, what do I mean by it does something beautifully? Well, the expansion slot sets out to correct one of the biggest problems that Flesh and Blood has, and that is the ever-expanding, ever-boundless imagination of Legend Story Studios, right? At any point, they can just throw in a new class, they can throw in a new subtype, they can throw whatever they want into a set, into the development of flesh and blood. So in order to stabilize that, in order to make sure that sets are sets are still themed, sets are still centered to a core demographic, they've introduced the expansion slot with the goal of then allowing them to create any cards they think are necessary outside of the themes of the main set to then be introduced in that set without disrupting any of the other aspects of the product. So the expansion slot enables them to expand the tournament card pool through adding in class cards and talents outside the core focus of the product while not disrupting new features such as Crack Shuffle Play or any other sort of limited format where you're playing with what's in the box, right? They can make a better experience to some extent of playing limited with any product of Flesh and Blood using this new system. Now, ever since 2.0, we have seen a great amount of experimentation done with flesh and blood. But it is my personal opinion that the expansion slot does mark the end of that sort of experimental era. And this is definitely going to be the blueprint going forward because again, what it does, it does so pretty well. So what is the expansion slot? The expansion slot will replace tokens in one in 15 boosters and feature cards that expand the lore of the game, expand the tournament card pool and offer classes and talents outside of the core focus of the product or serve as a way for them to insert spot reprints, such as the Ferrandale Spring Tunic, which will be featured in Bright Lights. So what this means is because it is replacing that token slot, right? It does not interfere in any way with the other cards of the set. You're still going to find your, on average, six Majestics that are related to Mech or Bright Lights within your box, right? So generally in a draft pod or limited format, you're going to have access to those and they're going to be playable cards rather than any of the Majestics they're introducing through the expansion slot, right? Because we've started to see spoilers and so far we've got an Assassin, Brutes, Ninja, Warrior, and Ranger, and then Emperor basically, or Draconic, however you want to look at it, right? So we have a diverse amount of cards here, but none of them, right? If you open any of them, you're not going to have the, oh cool, I got this card finally, but now I can't use it in my pod, in my limited, in any of the sealed play that we're undergoing. So that is a great function of the expansion slot to again, still offer these cards to players, but remove the interaction element from limited formats. So again, it won't feel as though you open this card, you're excited because it is one of these hard to find cards, but now it's disrupted your limited play. But there is one singular drawback that comes from this new stylization, right? And that is that limited play might feel one dimensional. If we only have access to one class in this case, or, you know, a, a few similar classes by way of combo, such as that featured in Outsiders, the draft experience could become very mundane, right? Because it's not about creating an interesting fun deck. It's just who can craft X hero, X class better. But again, this isn't so much an issue of the expansion slot as it is an issue with the design of Flesh and Blood. They're going to get to a point of critical mass where there are too many classes, too many things to support, where it doesn't matter what they put into a box, they have to be somewhat similar for the box to then have a proper limited play style, right? If they just stick in four different classes with four different subtypes, right? It's all going to get muddled and you're not going to be able to actually enjoy limited play as much as you would in a one dimensional product such as bright lights. Now, I know I'm saying one dimensional, right? We do have the different facets and avenues of Mechanologist, but again, I, I personally believe, and I'm sure a lot 
people still have this mentality in comparison to the entirety of flesh and blood and what we've seen it is one dimensional right it is a soul focused product on mechanologists and regardless of the playstyle on evos on steam counters on any of these new features on, on cranking right making use of items it's still going to feel like a mechanologist where you're utilizing these extra cards in your deck as more so of an item mechanic rather than the playstyle of say brute where you're interrupting and intimidating and and being aggressive against your opponent Right, so in that comparison to the plethora that Legendary Studios have put on offer for Flesh and Blood, it is one dimensional to me. But again, no matter what concerns or, or problems I foresee coming out of the expansion slot, the rewards and its utility outweigh all of that, right? The expansion slot is great for the game, right? It now gives them a core blueprint to use for future sets, a way to introduce new ideas and new elements without, again, disrupting what products were meant to serve. Right? They're meant to be open, they're meant to be played with, they're meant to be enjoyed in all these different facets, and none of that has to be compromised thanks to the expansion slot. As for those concerns, well, what are they? Simply put, the pull rate of the expansion slot. And in fact, this whole paragraph of information is a bit loose, right? So we're told that they are one in 15. Is this a weighted average? Is this the general consensus for the entirety? So it's always going to be one expansion slot of box, right? There are a lot of concerns and issues surrounding this number, the pull rate, and the cards that feature within the slot, right? If we have access to these majestics that have been spawned so far at one in 15 a box, right? So you're getting one of these a box, you have to cycle through all of them, you have to then compete with the other cards, so the, the key reprints, the Spring Tunic, as well as any of the lore cards that I don't think we've seen anything yet, right? I'm not sure if they're going to be playable, if they're going to be art, or if they're just going to be cards uh, similar to Murloc Hill, which just has a fun mechanic that might see play, might not see play, but is separated from, again, those, those tournament stylized cards, cards that are meant to be viable in a competitive scene. But to that extent, again, at 1 in 15, if any of these cards become auto includes within their respective class at one in 15 that is quite the bottleneck surrounding the cards and then there's also the concerns of overall balancing do they detract from the majestics have that been changed there's just a lot of information we just don't know about just yet but it still does appear that this could be another divisive element for flesh and blood outside of just the premise of bright lights wonderfully on the reddit We've got this question posed, thoughts on the expansion slot so far. Again, the main concern brought up is similar to the one I have. The only negative I've seen brought up so far is that some cards in the expansion slot are too hard to pull and may end up being class staples, which then could lead to there being a bottleneck and inflating these cards to a very high price. As for the responses, well, again, from my glancing read, they seem to be on both sides of the argument. It's a great way to make sure that every class now has some sort of presence within every set. It might be only minor, but there's still going to be something for everyone. So regardless of whether or not you're opening the main product, there's going to be something on the secondary market for you to pick up, collect and play with. But of course, then we also again have the very low drop rates, which depending on the main crux of the cards available in the slot, could be very detrimental in the case of the spring tunic and probably help retain some of its value not just completely tanking it whereas for the majestics again it could create that bottleneck then there's also the sort of counter argument where again there's not enough information if the m's of the slot have the same pull rates as normal m's then it should be fine but that's not what we're told we're told one in 15 so again it's it's sort of this issue of why present us with one in 15 right why not just say the expansion slot will feature blah, 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 we'll replace tokens, don't need to tell us any of the odds, don't need to sort of fill our heads with these ideas or concerns just yet, not until everything is worked out. Because at one in 15, one in 15 makes it sound like you get a box, you're going to get one to two, that's it, right? But if it is a weighted average, right, the legendary or the key reprints could be exponentially higher. And then the majestics to balance it out could be a lot more common and you could end up with, you know, two to three Majestics in every box, right? To, to help also compensate for the normal amount of Majestics you get. So there's just a lot of other questions and concerns that are raised from the figures provided. And again, a lack of information presented on the expansion slot other than just a cursory glance. They're solving the problem with new classes. Again, fantastic, right? Because it means that, again, they can go wild with their imagination and just use the expansion slot to rein it in to make sure, again, that there is something for everyone, that other classes still getting support, that, you know, we don't go, how many sets was it for Mechanologist? Before we got a solid themed set, right? Arcane Rising was the last, no? Grew a little bit, all the expansions a little bit, 
but then no standard or core set featuring mechanologist for at least six, right? Seven, you gotta give a reason for non-mech players to buy the set. Now, this I don't quite agree with, right? Because no one in their right mind, given the odds, would be buying the set to fish for cards outside of mech, unless you're interested even a little in the mech, you're going to just use the secondary market. So I don't think that is the overall function of this. Again, you gotta remember, Legend Story Studios aren't this huge company. I'm not saying they don't have a presence. I'm not saying they don't do numbers, but they don't have to, they don't have to meet quarterly reports like other companies, right? The initial launch of a set doesn't have to be its highest point. Yes, it's great if it is, and yes, it usually is, but it doesn't have to be. And I think personally that they do pay a lot of attention to the secondary market. And again, reciting the philosophy, they want to have a certain level of interaction with it and controlled interaction at that. I don't know how anyone could see this as a bad thing. The timing might be kind of bad considering this is following D to D, which was a restrictive and supplementary set. The majority of people complaining about it are one deck Andes. So people who generally specialize in one class and therefore want you know, some level of support for their class in every major set. But hopefully those players do put their best foot forward and try the set or at least shut their mouth for the deathmatch launch, right? Because I think I think there are definitely a lot more brute players than mechanologists. So I think a lot of people are excited for Savage Lands or Deathmatch. Which if you don't uh, understand that reference, right? Look at cards. The capitalization on cards are usually hints at, towards next sets. So the general speculation is that the next set going forward will be heavily brute themed. Big fan on paper so far. I remember one of the big issues going to Tails was that there was no generic cards besides a few crappy equipment, which then sucks that there is nothing to even consider with a new set. So at least with Bright Lights, right? If you're not a fan of mech, you're still excited to see the spoilers and excited to find out what little cards you know, if any, your class or your main is going to receive. And then that's why I always enjoy them doing classic supplemental sets that support a different class. Yes, I think in this in this context, right, Dust Till Dawn should have come out after Bright Lights. Right, we got Bright Lights, we saw the new way they were going to handle stand sets, and then Dust Till Dawn comes out and we see the new way they handle supplemental, rather than the supplemental set, you know, essentially, Again, creating the, the divisive element on whether or not, you know, which set should be themed for everyone, which set should feature class cards for everyone, which set should be specific and specialized, right? It's a bit up in the air. I think it being the standard set with the introduction of the expansion slot would have been better. And then also featuring the expansion slot for Dust Till Dawn, having Dust Till Dawn, again, be a minor set, non-draftable, or again, even just go with all draftable sets at this point, right? Have the supplemental sets be the four class draftables, have the standard sets be the single class or combo class draftables, something like that might be a little bit better. Uh, I have to double check my math, but doesn't the 1 in 15 packs essentially translate to the same pool rates for a specific Majestic? As in, if there are 10 Majestics in the expansion slot before Majestics in the main set, there's a 1 in 15 is not too far off of getting one of those specific cards. The 6 to 8 you pull from the average box. Uh, yes, so again, this this generally is is just filling in too many numbers for me, right? We don't know. We also don't know, again, the competition for the expansion slot revolving around the other cards. We don't know if the actual Majestic slot in the main set is going to be tweaked so that you're still pulling around six, maybe slightly higher. You know, we there's, again, too much information we don't have just yet. This next comment is perfect. Basically, it's an attempt to solve the issue of allowing a set to contain cards for a wider range of heroes, as well as reprints of key cards from the past without messing with how the set plays for limited formats, right? So again, the expansion slot, its sole purpose is to correct sets and make sure that every facet of play, competitive, limited, sealed, I know sealed part of limited, I just like adding things to a list, right? Things are better in threes. The expansion slot beautifully tackles that issue, right? It doesn't detract, it only adds the concern again that I have, right? I'm not saying the expansion slot is bad. I'm just saying it could be handled differently or, you know, until we get the full numbers, right? There are the concerns that cards are A, too hard to pull or B, a sort of worse lottery system than, than the cold balls, which again, detracts from the interest in opening boxes. Because again, no one, no one will go out of the way to open for the expansion slot. You're going to have an interest in collecting some of the met cards at the very least. And then you're going to get the expansion slot as the cherry on top. So again, it, it plays into the hands more of people opening mass boxes like usual and then reselling cards, right? It's not really designed for the common play. It's again, a nice little cherry on top, but is not something for you to go out of your way hunting. Again, the whole statement of use the secondary markets if you actually want cards, 
rings way, way more true for Flesh and Blood than any other game to me. I like the idea. I'm not sure I'm sold on the execution. Yep, that's pretty much where I'm at the moment until we get the full information. I, I'm a bit worried about how they're actually executing it. Regarding hard to pull, uh, these are mainly M's currently. Majestic's had only one slot before as well. So regarding the pull rates, shouldn't change. Well, no, not quite. Because again, the slot doesn't matter because it's, it's replacing the R's. So if anything, in that sentiment right r's are reduced not m's are improved or anything like that technically yes you do have the two slots to pull m's but again pull rates are sort of whatever lss decides right so until we get the concrete numbers it's still an issue true but these cards will be from a separate pool also it's going to be one in 15 i thought majestics were less rare than that don't you get way more than two majestics per box yeah so again you know one to two special majestics if you will expansion majestics and then your usual six, probably. Or again, maybe some reduction in the actual main set Majestics. Well, that's true. We don't know how many expansion cards there are. Yeah, there's way too many factors that we just don't know yet. Uh, I dislike it greatly, actually. The fact we got a support set that was basically Monarch 2.0, followed by a mech set with the same system, means that there are now a ton of classes that are only interested in a single card from two separate sets. That is, again, 100% true. It's not set up for you to buy boxes, to open boxes, to find your cards. Okay, every game is, is built that way, flesh and blood more so, right? So use the secondary market if you want specific cards, that's fine. Again, they're really, really careful about upsetting the power balance of cards, which is great. They either come out with a new idea or they just very, very minorly add cards to the class pool, just enough to shake it up without, again, sort of overriding the, the class staples. I have absolutely zero reason to open any box from the last set. Or the next, as someone that doesn't play mech, light, illusionist, light warrior, shadow, room blade, or brute. It's a grand total of five subclasses. They've got major game-changing support, while the rest are vying for a single card in literally six months of content. Yes. Again, personally, I would like to see them ramp up, ramp up <laughs> content to an extent. It's, it's sort of a backward statement, right? So what I would like them to see is do smaller, compact sets. Again, sort of like bright light centered around one class, but have more regular releases. You know, so in a year... You know, if, if there's, we could see one every two months or something like that, right? So six classes get handled every year, right? And that way you can continue to cycle through. You can add a few little bit as the, again, the, the pools inflate. But overall, they're not setting up boxes to be sold to be open. They're, they're setting up boxes to be sold to stores to open to sell singles or to open and play with, right? They're the, the two core markets that they're tapping into. They're not tapping into the average person spending, right? Which is a little bit bad, a little bit good. Depends on your vantage point. Uh, honestly, I'm still puzzled what the goal of a one class zero talent product is. Then yeah, just they want they want limited play to be perfect, which brings me to another point, right? They are slowly working their way through everything, right? So the compared scene took off this year has been the best by far. I would say it's, it's probably stable at this point. Now they're moving on to to shoring up casual and limited play, right? So then hopefully next up is PVA. Uh, for me, drafting some sets can be very boring because you aren't drafting cool deck, you're just trying to build the best version of one deck. Yes, right, so that is the issue I also foresee with the bright lights, also with outsiders, is the decks you're making are going to overlap heavily with one another, right, and it's just who can build the best deck, or, or who can play the deck the best, which I think is also another good testament, because again, Flesh and Blood is a highly skilled game, right? Learning and executing the craft perfectly is the rewarding thing for most players of Flesh and Blood. I preferred the previous model where they alternated between draft sets focusing on two or three classes and supplemental sets. Yes, there, there is positives and negatives to every model. Again, I think it really zeroes in on the digestion factor of Flesh and Blood, right? Boxes have never been good, right? In all honesty, right? Finding, chasing cards in boxes has, has never been really fulfilling unless you're opening on mass. So I think they're finally leaning into that and again, targeting limited play with the expansion slot. I'm just worried we now get to wait even longer between draft sets, waiting for draft sets. We're interested in seeing. So to this, to this avail again, right? This, the bright lights should have been smaller, right? I, I, I'm very interested to see. 200 cards for mech is fine, but if they were to do say Runeblade, I'm pretty sure Runeblade has by far the most cards in their pool at, at this time, right? They wouldn't need 200 cards. You could do a 100 card set, 50 cards in the expansion slot, something like that, right? Make it easier. Again, tackle the limited 
play uh, in terms of, of collecting all the cards and opening, right? We're moving away from that market once again. I keep hoping for new flavors of old champs. Now, we're sort of getting off topic now, but yes, I do too, right? I'd love to see just more versions of every hero. Even just younger versions would be grace, right? Uh, again, the, the supplemental stuff, Blitz decks and the classic battles, which we're still yet to see. Another one of a great way to do that. I feel bad when classes have complete duds of a card, right? Yeah, so if you're only getting a handful, it's it's very much hit or miss at that point because you don't have the the expansive nature to soak up the, the grievances towards, you know, your favorite class getting its, its support. I have high hopes for the expansion slot. Well, oh, this is a good one. It's the last one too, perfect. Uh, bros. History has shown that even a single card can breathe new life into a hero. Yep, great, right? Again, so having that refinement and the reduction so that they can now focus on what this card will do, how it will affect the game is great. A reason for non mechanologist players to buy for more than limited play. Yeah, uh, if, you're, if you're buying multitudes of cases, I mean, already, how many cards do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six. If you're getting two a box at that, say we'll do two every, We'll say three every two boxes, right? So you already have to buy a case and then you also have to get lucky not to get the overlap. Plus then you have all the other factors. So at the current pull rates, right? It just really hones in on open and mass or buy singles. Possibility of having more cards under our rarity that retain value without being budget unfriendly. That's that's actually a great way of, of thinking about it, actually. Again, I, I don't think Majestics, I don't think cards outside of the chase should retain value. I think Flesh and Blood should really work on having a perfect divide between what is collectible and what is playable so that you can meet the standards of everyone in the community. Because again, you're right, there's always going to be people who want things to be cheap and playable, and there's going to be people who want their cards to hold value and be something they can invest in, right? And so I think re regaining that dynamicism would be great. And to some extent, the DD again has done that. We have the cheaper Rainbow Falls and we have the, the cards actually hold value, the Cold Fall Legendaries. Allows the designs to focus the rest of the cards, I'm going to say, on limited formats. You don't know enough about the rest of the set to speculate on how good it is in limited play, make a solid deck. Yeah, again, they can just focus the product, which is always a great thing. Again, to me personally, they're trying to to shape the product as something to, to play with, right? Not something to just open, crack in, get your cards, and then go to your armory. They want people to actually really partake in the limited events. Cons, it's a set with a single class. If players aren't interested in that class, then they're not going to buy much of the sealed product. I don't think there are lots of people who do buy lots of sealed product to begin with, All right? Again, the, the competitive scene is, is by far the biggest aspect of Flesh and Blood. And the majority of competitive players are going to look for their cards. They're not going to, to spin the wheel, so to speak, which is fine. Again, I, I want them to lean into their strengths rather than try to make something that balances it out. The rarity of the expansion slot is concerning as slightly over one per box. They'll be hard to pull. Fab is already hard to collect. How much worse does it need to be? Fab is already hard to collect. That is that is an interesting statement to me. What do you think? Do you think Fab's hard to collect? Depends on what you, you define as collecting, right? If you want all promos, yeah. If you want all cold falls to some degree, right? There are lots of cold falls you can get. You can build a, a beautiful cold fall collection. Might not be worth much, right? I mean, you could win by quantity, but it'll be beautiful. And then product sitting on shelves. Well, you guys sort of bite the bullet, right? The the branding for Legend Story Studios, in the case of Monarch Everfest, is is basically that, right? They they are going to sit there. They're going to be in a warehouse for a little bit, and they're going to slowly, slowly be consumed by the player base. So I think again, leaning to that again, sort of being a a board game style game, right? Because think about it, you're you're paying eighty bucks for bright lights, right? And you can treat it basically like a board game. Okay, you can play with it. You can play limited, you can get a ton of hours out of it just through playing limited. And then you have the cards at the end of the day. So I think leaning in onto that strength on it being, oh cool, you know, we wanna do flesh and blood this month or this week and right? Uh, why don't we go pick up a box of this set and we can have a, a mechanologist limited play session or we could have a brute limited play session. So I think leaning in, to all of that could work out in the future, especially again, as the, the expansive nature of Flesh and Blood really gets to shine. Anyway, I think we'll leave it there for the expansion slot. I don't know, let me know your thoughts and opinion. Again, I still have the same concerns. I, I come off a bit more narcissistic or pessimistic than I mean to be, in all honesty. Again, I love the game. I love all aspects of what LSS are doing. 
Doesn't mean I can't nitpick. Doesn't mean I can't figure out concerns. Again, a lot of the concerns I did raise, you know, other people have voiced the same opinions. And again, look, everyone is wonderful in the fab community at having a proper conversation. So yeah.